All right, so we are live in Yukon, Oklahoma, even though we didn't do a countdown this time, because there's no countdown, it just automatically starts recording. It's really nice. Um, <clears throat> we're exploring the supernatural worldview based off the Bible. And because of that, we're coming across a lot of strange stuff. You guys agree with that? Yes. There's some pretty weird stuff in the Bible. Yes. But, you know, my philosophy is very simple. If it's weird in the Bible, God has a reason for us to study it. And even though some of it will be highly controversial, such as today's lesson, it will get into some controversy areas and we'll get an opportunity to have discussions on it. All right. So with that, uh, we're doing lesson four on the angelic rebellions, plural. And I'm going to do a, a quick uh, update to what we did last week. We talked about the anointed cherub who fell. He was the first one to rebel. There's a series of rebellions that take place. This is the first one. Lucifer rebels. Uh, you guys also know that then he tricked uh, Eve into rebelling and Adam gung-ho went right along with it. He wasn't tricked at all. He was a treasoner. Okay, so he just rebelled against God on his own. But um, we'll learn more about that as we get further into the study. But this particular creature here was God's seal of perfection. It was the signet ring for all of his creation, this creature was. And this creature is the one that rebelled against God first. So if you got wayward teenagers and you wonder what the world's going on, realize that no matter how good of a job you did as a parent, or not a good job, either way, they have their own free will. And so we have to keep them in prayer, basically. All right, so uh, this anointed cherub, by the way, uh, a cherub is a weird-looking creature. We always call them angels. They are not angels, okay? The word angel is a title for a job. Do you guys realize that? Angel means a messenger. So there's lots of different creatures that God has that are messengers, and they're not all the same. Uh, most of the messengers or angels that the Bible talks about they look like humans when they appear uh, in, in the stories. But there are some of these angels that don't look at anything like any creature we know of, such as this guy here. He's got four heads and six wings. Very odd. But we'll get into that further as we get further into our story. So we found out that this creature, the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15, was the first one to rebel against Jehovah, or Yahweh, God. And we find out also that he was called the morning star, the shining one, very bright. He had all over his body uh, jewels that were, uh, these precious jewels that, that they were shiny. And uh, he had 10 jewels. There are 12 that are on the breastplate for the high priest. But of the 12 that are in the high priest, he wears 10 of them. So it's like, wow. And he found out that um, he's called the fallen one also, the very first one to fall. Now, that's a weird word for us to use, fall, because to us in English, it means gravity took hold of you and pulled you down, right? You <laughs> fell. But actually, it's a moral statement that he was the first one to rebel against God and disobey God's rules and laws. And so that is what the word fall means also. It doesn't mean necessarily yet that he's been completely cast out of heaven. And we talked about that previously. Even in the book of Job, when we did a study on that, we found out in Job 1 and Job 2, there are the counsel of God comes together and the, the Satan, and we put the word the in front of it because again, it's a title, not a name. It's a job. He's the adversary. The adversary shows up and... That's when God says, did you see my righteous one, Job? Yeah, well, he's only righteous because you take care of him. Okay, you do what you want, but you can't kill him, right? So the story goes on. Well, that's an interesting situation because when I first taught that, what, maybe more than two years ago, we all wondered, what? Satan's got access to heaven? What's going on there? And as you continue doing more and more studies, you find out even today he still has access. But there is coming a day in the future... The Bible says, at, in the middle of the Great Tribulation, 
there will be a war in heaven, and he will be cast out along with a third of the angels. So we'll get to that story, because we got. if you look at our syllabus, it tells us we're going to talk about the holy war later. So we'll get more detail with that one. Well, in the meantime, he has these I-5 wills in Isaiah 14. It says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will sit my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. That's the, the, the council that God brings together. I will ascend above the clouds. Uh, I'm going to make myself like the most high. See, he's full of pride. And pride was the reason why he fell. And remember, he was proud of what he looked like also. He said, you know, um, well, how can I put this? It's, it's like celebrities today. Oh, yeah. Celebrities today say, look at me. Well, that's what he's doing. All right, but he was the first one to do it. Quite shocking. All right. So then the last thing that we talked about last week is this slide here. This one got a whole lot of talk. Yeah. Free will. I, I put it as a syllogism. A syllogism is a logic. If you start with a statement and you build up on that, you come to a conclusion. So the syllogism here is that we all agree God made everything perfect. And one of the perfect things that God created um, rebelled. And then we find out that they, these perfect creatures have free will. They can choose that. And we find out that free will is actually the cause of evil. Before free will, there was no evil because everybody did exactly what they were created to do. They had no will. But when God gave free will to some of his creatures, we will find out that some of them rebelled quite a bit. And so I had a statement here. So imperfection, evil, can arise out of things that are perfect. And we're wondering, well, how is that? Indirectly, that happens because of free will. So there was, a, there was a discussion last week about, is it free will that's causing the evil? Um, and I said, well, OK, if we want to say indirectly through free will, that's fine with me too. But I'm going to stick with my statement. Free will is what's the cause. So we then have a problem. Why would God, who knows that their rebellion is going to happen, still create the creatures with free will. So that's where we pick up at. That's what we left off with last week. Does everybody agree? Right. So why would he do that? Why is he creating creatures with free will, knowing, since he's all-knowing, that they're going to rebel? He wants us to come to him because of the decision we make to accept him as our... Yeah, so he's obviously wanting us to do that ourselves out of our own free will, but why? Why? Go ahead. Because we're created in his image, which tells us that that's a characteristic of God that's important for life. So since we're created in the image and likeness of God, let's not forget the two parts of it. Mm -hmm. The image and likeness of God, we therefore know God has perfect free will. And then it's like he said, he wants us to choose him. He wants us to choose him. So that we can fellowship. It's for fellowship purposes. Actually, he wants a family. Yeah. He wants a family. He wants us to come to him out of love, not because we have to. Correct. So we come to him out of love. Because without free will, you cannot have love. <coughs> love requires free will. Yes. It requires you to make a choice. Are you going to love an object or not? And therefore, that love... Um, that God creates a family and what would it be like if he created all of us and automatically no matter what we just love him and um, which I think that would be great for me but at the same time then for him as the creator he's like well I just now built a bunch of robots yeah, right, yeah. yeah and those of us who have been around robots know that even they mess up yeah <laughs> but um Perfection is an interesting concept. And when God says that Lucifer was the signet ring of perfection, and yet he fell, we, we have some challenges in our own lives now. And being images or image bearers, being immatures of God, we have also additional responsibility. Because we learned from our lesson previously that that means we represent God on earth. We are his representative, his image 
bearers. So he doesn't look like us physically. He's, that word image is a verb, which most people think of it as a noun. But it's the immature. It's a verb meaning that you represent him in this kingdom in, on the earth. So with that, I think we might have caught up. Are we ready to go forward? No. All right, let's see where we are. So the question then is, then why is there such a mess here? Why is the world such a mess? What is the normal Christian answer to why the world is a mess? Not enough Jesus in sin. Louder for me? Not enough Jesus in <laughs> <laughs> My grandma said it to me last night. All right. <laughs> Grandma's full of wisdom there. <laughs> if you're explaining to somebody else why the world is such a mess, what do we start with? Satan and sin. The fallen nature of man. The mankind. fallen nature. Okay, so we got Satan, not enough Jesus in the world. We have um, free will, yeah. So this is what the normal answer is for most Christians. If you ask a typical Christian, one who at least studies the Bible, they're usually going to point to the fall of Adam Eve and the serpent. That's the start. And they don't go any further. Oh. <clears throat> Except they do say that Lucifer is now the, the, the God of this world. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's not any further. The story is still the same. How would a person in ancient Near Eastern culture during the time of the writings of Moses and others, how would that person explain why the world's a mess? Would they do the same thing? Would they tell the story of Adam and Eve? Or would there be something additional? For example, if you spend some time, even today, if you have a friend that's a rabbi, and you ask them, what is the reason why everybody is so sinful? What would their answer be? It's not a Christian answer. So let's understand it. Is it the, the dragon? Does that have anything to do with it? Well, the dragon's a part of it, but we, we have them in the serpent story already. So let's go see what it means. Oh, go ahead. Evil lives in the heart of man. Evil lurks in the heart of man. The shadow knows. <laughs> We're all different. We all have free will. But why does that mean? That, but why does that mean the entire world's a mess? Yeah, we all different things, and that causes conflict. Yeah, it causes conflict. Okay. We're going to go back to there are three reasons why the world's a mess. Okay? If you ask the first century Jew why the world's a mess, you're not going to get the answer that the Christians give right now. There are three reasons the world is a mess. Now let's see what they are. Okay? So in ancient Near Eastern culture, that's what A-N-E means, ancient Near Eastern and how the Jews look at the world is the following. First, they go back to Genesis 3, which we all did marvelously. We, we, we're like masters of Genesis 3. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because no matter what your age is, you start with that and you learn all about it, either in Sunday school or in adult Bible classes or, or preachers telling you you're, you have a sinful nature. So what we see here is there's Eden. What is Eden, by the way? The garden where God's garden. council is sitting. And the Eden is the temple. The garden of Eden is around the temple. Okay? The temple, which is where God is and his council is meeting, and it's a mosaic. It, it gives us this image. It uses vocabulary like the temple. For it says that Adam and Eve were to work the garden, the word there for work, is a word that's used in Levitical, uh, in the priesthood, as a person who's doing uh, religious rituals before God, doing work before God. And we also know that they were to clean up the garden, because they were supposed to do some, you know, practical work also, <laughs> not just the spiritual work. Well, we see that evil enters into the world. Death entered. <sighs> Death Humankind became estranged from God. And we see that this is also in Genesis 3 is when the rebellion takes place. And the old sin nature, ooh, the old sin nature 
is now being transferred to all mankind. Meaning this, through one man, all of us receive sin and we die from that. And from one man, all of us receive eternal life and we live. So the one man that we die from is our Adam nature, and the one man who came to free us from that is Jesus. So the, what I just now gave you is what Romans 5.12 talks about. So let's go ahead and move, move over to our Bibles to Romans 5.12, and let's take a look at that. Romans 5.12. So what we see here, is verse in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, and then it goes on to tell us, you know, about that. So I'm, I'm trying to show you a point that back in Genesis 3 is the start of why we all sin and die, but you also have your individual sin based off your own free will. So you have a biological sin that's transferred to every cell in your body. And if you want to know more about that, we'll get further into study later about how that happens. Because I can show you biologically what's happening during meiosis and mitosis as to how sin is being transferred through the male, not the female. And also we find out, although you know females who are born from men will have sin, but there is a male that was born uh, who did not have sin, Jesus. He had to be born through a virgin. There's a reason for that, doctrinally as well as biologically, as to how he had no sin in his body. But we'll, that's another study for another time. That's kind of like just give you on the side there. You might want to do a little bit of research on that. So we have this sin is transferred, but what would be the other two reasons? Well, let's take a look at it. Ah, Genesis 6, verses 1 through 5. Do you guys know what that is? That's the story of the Nephilims. Yes. You've heard of the Nephilims? Oh, yeah. All right. So ancient Judaism <laughs> universally associates the proliferation of human depravity back to when the sons of God married the daughters of men and produced giants on the land nephilims so we're going to get into that today all right so that's number two that was a rebellion that took place so now we have two rebellions so far the rebellion in genesis 3 and the rebellion that happens in genesis 6. ancient near eastern culture will say there's one more event that takes place in the bible that was a significant disaster for mankind what do you think that would be? The flood. Well, that's definitely a disaster having a flood. But this came after the flood. Babel. That's right. So what we have here is Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel incident resulted in fragmenting humanity. And we're going to find out the sons of God are involved in that one also. The sons of God are involved in all three of these. So uh, we will get into Genesis 6 today and then probably next week into the story of Babel. Or as my daughter pronounced it, Babel. My Hebrew professor, I asked him the other day, how do you say this word? He goes, what, you mean Babel? I go, yes. <laughs> that's when they were babbling. Uh, that's when they were babbling. <laughs> At, at Babel. All right. So let me move on now. And what we find out is this, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Because we're going to start there and, and know a little bit more about what does it mean the sons of God marry the daughters of men and they produce Nephilim. Their, out, their outcome, their, their offspring, their children are called Nephilim. So let's go find out what that is about. Because there's different stories about that one. You know, matter of fact, that's like one of the most controversial things right now going on in the church. Is understanding what's going on in chapter 6. It's interesting that the church is interested in that now too. Because as we get closer and closer to the end days, it says just like in the times of Noah, things are going to be happening. 
Well, the Nephilim were around in the time of Noah. What is that all about? So people are trying to figure it out. And people on the fringe are trying to figure it out. Space people, UFOs. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stories out there. So let's take a look at what it actually says. And, and we're going to look at uh, Genesis 6 and verse uh, 1. I'll start there. <clears throat> now it came about, oh, I guess I should read what's on my slides instead of my Bible. My Bible is the, uh, in, the NASB, but I like the ESV for studying. So I'll just read what I did on ESV up here. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took them as their wives as they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. What is this talking about? That's, verse 4 is confusing then because it says... Um, they were on the earth and also afterwards yes, when they, the sons of men came. So it happens twice. In those days and also afterwards. Uh, see, let me see if my uh, NASB has it any differently. Uh, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, the daughters were born to them. Oh, that makes sense. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took them as wives, whomever they wanted. Ah, sound like no free will there for the girls. Verse 3, And then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Ah, that's kind of strange. Why would God say that? And then number 4, The Nephilim, they were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those who were the mighty men were of old. They're also known as renowned men. <clears throat> they're known as heroes. That's what it's talking about. Mighty men that were heroes. Okay? So, who are the sons of God? The sons of God were on the council, the council of God. This is why I'm confused, because I just read a whole thing on the Nephilim. Yeah. And they are giants. You know, and there's even, they've even found the bones and whatever, so we know they're real. But the way that <coughs> is, they're not the ones that mated with the women. It was the sons of God. The so sons of God. The outcome are the giants. If, if you were reading a... A King James Bible, it would say giants were on the earth. Okay? Because in the Septuagint, remember the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew Bible back in about uh, 400 years before Jesus, it was translated and put into Greek. So by the time Jesus comes around, they're reading and quoting from the Septuagint. Don't know if you know that, but most of the authors in the New Testament are quoting the Septuagint and not the Hebrew Bible. So the Septuagint says they're giants, if you translate it into English. But the Hebrew says they're Nephilim, the outcome. But both of them, neither one, either Nephilim or giant, whatever word you want to use, they're the offspring of sons of God and daughters of men. What are the sons of God? the mighty men the second generation yeah mighty men is is they come afterwards right. they're they're the continuation afterwards that'd be like children grandchildren great-grandchildren right. but we're not talking about them yet we're talking about who are these sons of god so when you mix they're, they're, they're immortal and you mix them with someone that's mortal then what is that I mean, well you're assuming that these are immortal so far we haven't yet identified who are the sons of God. I keep asking that question over and over. We hear they're on the council. Who are they? They're created beings. They're created. Are they the angels or not? Because there's different arguments in the church right now. We're all hesitant to use the word angel. Yeah. An angel is 
Yeah. Are they are they spiritual beings? Yes. But they had to be physical beings as well. They had to be physical. If they if had if they're having children. Yes. Okay. So they're spiritual, but they're physical. Okay. There's one more verse here. I'll bring up. Okay. And then we'll get into more detail. The verse here is number five. <laughs> the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Why does it tie that verse with the other four verses? They were fallen. They were fallen ones. Yeah, Nephilim actually means fallen ones. Yeah. Oh. And it also means giant. Mm -hmm. So they have a fallen nature, giant, etc. But so, but there's a controversy in the church today. Are they really the fallen angels? To say are are the sons of God these? spiritual creatures that we have talked about earlier, the ones on the council, or are they something else? Because this is a big controversy in the church, if you don't know that. So let me show you what that controversy is. Because obviously you guys, there's no controversy here. Okay. We've already been studying the sons of God. We know exactly who they are. <laughs> All right. So here's the theological views of this chapter. There are two prominent interpretations. There are a total of six interpretations, but there are two that are the most prominent in the church, in Christianity. The first one is a supernatural view. The sons of God are these angels, these, these divine beings, these spirit beings, whatever you want to call them. They are ones that sit with God on his council, as we said earlier. Those are the sons of God. They were present when the world was created. When the universe was created, they were already created beforehand. And they rejoiced at the creation. We learn that in Job. So that's one view. That's the prevalent view for most of the uh, Jews all the way up into in Christianity in the year 300 or so. We got a different view suddenly from Augustine. You guys know who Augustine is? Augustine of Hippo? Yeah. He's a famous church, um, uh, classical church father. And this is what he said. No, no, this is not supernatural. This is natural. He uses a view. Augustine, by the way, was in the year 354. He died in 430. So, you know, this is 400 years after Jesus. He came up with this view. The sons of God are the descendants from Seth. Did archaeology pull up, find something new to make him think this? No. Back in his days, he didn't have any archaeology. Yeah, that's he had his own thinking that was inspired by a different creature than the one I follow. Uh. But anyways. <laughs> but Seth is the line of righteousness. You all know that the Messiah comes through the line of Seth, right? Yes. right. Yeah, yeah. Cain... He's the bad guy, right? right. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is this view is that the sons are the righteous lineage of Seth and the daughters are from the line of Cain. And, and so, so all the women were unrighteous. See, there's, a, there's some gaps in this thinking here. <laughs> Men, get up, <laughs> grab your sword. <laughs> All right, so. No, that, that, that doesn't work because they're all descended from Adam and Eve. Everyone that was descended from Adam and Eve was fallen. So yeah, he's, he's, everybody was. Everybody was. So, see, there's, there's some logic issues here. Um, does this mean that only those who were males from Seth were all righteous in God's eyes what about the other children that had males? Were they all unrighteous? We only know of three, Abel, Cain, and Seth. Right. But, but it also says that they had more yes. children. Yes. Yes. It doesn't name them because it only names the ones important to the, the Messiah lineage. Mm -hmm. But we do know that there were other males, other females that were born to Eve. And we know that um, this logic here, only the righteous are from Seth. And everybody, all the women who came from Cain, were all of them were bad. This, this is a, this is a faulty thinking. 
But I got to tell you, this is a common thinking in the church today. So, if uh, the Nephilim, if the fallen angels came down, had sex with the women, they must be like some kind of rock stars or something. <laughs> they identify themselves. So... Well, let's, let's learn a bit more about this. Ruby. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah. The women were enamored to... I have a little argument that why it doesn't make sense. What's that? Because it said in verse, was it four, that it was also after the days of Noah, and the line of uh, Cain was wiped out by them. Okay. It was only the line of Noah at that So, point. see, logic. There's holes here. If after Noah, it happens again, we have giants again... Do we or do we not during the time of Joshua? Yes. 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 What were they all afraid of when they had to go live in the desert for 40 years? They were afraid that we were like insects. We were like grasshoppers to the giants. So there's still giants later on. Uh, almost more than a thousand years later. Well, let's see what happens here. So, so because of that, and she said, that means after Noah, the lineage of at of Cain was all wiped out. The only ones left were Noah, his his three sons, and their three daughters. And let's go see what happens here. Oh, there's a problem with this view also, those Nephilims. How could humans, male and female, produce giants? A herd of them. <laughs> the Nephilim. Okay, now there is there are diseases today. We know that it, there's a pituitary gland, hyperpituitary gland uh, disease that produce giants. I was just reading just this week in a part of my, you know, getting ready for the story today. I was reading about this guy who's the largest man and he was sitting next to the smallest woman. And the largest man was over eight and a half feet tall. And he stood next to the smallest woman, and the smallest woman was a little bit over a foot tall. And you see these together, and you're like, oh my gosh, what a difference. Um, and then also, as was indicated earlier, archaeologists have found a lot of bones from giants, although a lot of them that have been reported are missing. Even the ones that were found here in Oklahoma during the 1800s. They're all missing. The Smithsonian Institute came, did a study on it, collected the bones, and no one's ever seen them again. But I read about it in one of our ancient newspapers. <laughs> but anyways. Like the Indiana Jones movie. They Indiana Jones, yeah. yeah. they just took them. All right. So part of this problem is these Nephilims. How could you produce a whole group from uh, male and female that are humans? There's something else going on here. So, so the didn't come from just a specific tribe like the Cherokee or something okay. like that that they could say yes we're all from this one tribe yeah. so the Nephilim will find out the second set we have the tribe names <coughs> the ones that were in the land of Israel we'll find out who they are as we get further in the story but we're only in the first phase okay. in Genesis 6 we don't hear anything about tribes or nothing else not until the Tower of Babel. <coughs> we hear something happens there. But right now, we're not that far in the story. Okay. So, Peter did not read the passage as being uh, about uh, humans and Settites. Peter has a different source. Do you guys know the source of Peter? Jesus. Let's, let's, let's look at the, what the Bible says. We go to 2 Peter... Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is Peter's uh, look at what happened. And you'll see here. Um, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned. Oh, wait a minute. When did they sin? <laughs> we know of Lucifer. Right. But if God did not spare angels, plural, when they sinned, but cast them into hell. He cast them into hell? When did that happen? And God committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So they're like in prison waiting for 
to court. In which case, no, they're like in jail waiting for court, and then they'll go to prison later. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my question. Okay, five. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, what I'm showing here is he's tying them together. That they, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and then it tells us about Noah. Right. This is happening in the same time period. Right. Something in critical is happening right now with these angels who have sinned against God. And it's also the same time as Noah. And that's the reason why a lot of people today, a lot of Christians are going back saying, well, what happened during the time of Noah when it says, like the days of Noah, so shall it happen again. What is that all about? And so as we study Peter here, Peter says, hey, they weren't, they weren't men. They weren't righteous men. The sons of God that took the women sinned. The angels sinned, and they got cast into hell. Oh, hell? Yeah, look at this. The word here for cast into hell is a verb. It's the Greek verb tartaru. It means to be thrust to tartatus. Have you guys ever heard of that word before? Except for those who are classical educated. Do you know where that is? Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Yeah, Doctor Who teaches on this also. <laughs> Tartatus. Okay? This place here <coughs> is deeper than Hades. I got, I got a map for it also in a moment. Go ahead. Uh, you keep forgetting, huh? Okay. So, I'll try to erase that part later. <laughs> this is PG. <laughs> so, listen. There's something special happening here. These angels were cast into this special location. And it is translated in English as hell, but that's a bad translation. Because hell is not the same as Tartarus. They're two separate places. So we'll see more about that in a moment. Now you remember? Is Tartarus a, a section of hell? Okay. So or Tartarus. Those angels because they yeah. saw creation. They witnessed creation. They, they witnessed all of it. So remember they fell in the special nastiness that they did. Do angels, do they become mortal? No. Yes, they do. We read that about you know, the fall of Lucifer. It says you will be cast down and you will die like men. I know, this is, this is like... How many questions can I come up with? I got a thousand of them right now. <laughs> but this is a special place. Only reserved for those who are chained in gloomy darkness. Waiting for the judgment day. Huh? The Greeks knew what they were talking about. The Greeks know the story also. Okay. Every society has myths. And every one of them have myths that go back to this period of time. All right. So the question is, do they still have a free will and are they still falling out? Well, this is only rebellion number two. I'm going to show you another rebellion number three that's not the same group, but they're also fallen angels. But what about today? And the Bible says that when, when, when during the, the seven-year period of tribulation, at the halfway point, a third of them are going to be cast out of heaven and they'll land here and it says all hell breaks loose. It's a horrible time when they get here. Yes. So these creatures are very powerful. I was always under the impression that angels were neither male nor female. Oh, that's a great question. See, are angels male or female or neither one of those? What's going on? See, this is the reason why we have questions. <laughs> every single one that's described, excuse me, every one that is described in the Bible as an angel look like men. They're all males. But remember what happened? Jesus, they try to trick Jesus. You guys remember that? The Pharisee says, okay, you know it all. You think you know everything. They're talking to Jesus this way. And they said, suppose there's a woman who gets married to a man. 
And before they can have children, the man dies. The Jewish requirement, the law, is that his next male relative becomes her husband if the person is not married. So it would be, be a brother. Why? Because you're supposed to have children and that's supposed to carry on. Well, they said, so the second brother, or the brother, marries her. And before they can have children, he dies also. I'm thinking, is she killing them off? But <laughs> <laughs> she don't want children? But now it happens again a third time. They're telling the story to Jesus. And, and they end up having seven brothers that all die. And then she dies. And then there's the resurrection. And so they ask Jesus, in the resurrection... Which one is she married to? None of them. And he says, you err because you don't know scripture. <laughs> I, that's like slapping the face to a Pharisee, right? <laughs> you err because you don't know scripture. And he says, in the resurrection, like the angels, there's no marriage. You're not going to be given in marriage and taken in marriage. And so Christians have interpreted that to mean, oh, then they're, they're, you know, angels don't have sex. Well, that's not true. Well, we're, we're seeing right here they were cast into hell for a reason. We're going to find out what Jude has to say about it too. Jude is even clearer. Oh, yeah. But let me ask you a question. Where in the Old Testament does it say this happened? Where does it say God did not spare angels? They sinned and he cast them into hell and they're waiting in gloomy darkness to be kept until the day of judgment. Revelation. No, where in the Old Testament? Where does Peter get this idea? See, and he's saying something that is supposed to be obvious to all the other Jews. Okay, let me, let me, here, here's an example. If I quote something, let's see how well you know it. With great power comes... Great responsibility. Now, why did you know that? Spider-Man. Because of Spider-Man. <laughs> right? It is a quote that she recognized. Okay, so so the Bible's full of those. The Bible's full of quotes that immediately you know the rest of it, even if you don't have the whole story. If you studied the Bible as the Jews would. Go ahead. Okay, I'm cheating like crazy. No, you're not cheating. You're using your tools. Yes, I'm going to use the tools. At the bottom of verse 5, it it references Ezekiel 26, 20. Ezekiel, which one? 26. Ezekiel 26. And what does Ezekiel 26, 20 say? Then I shall bring you down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I shall make you dwell in the lower parts of the earth, like the ancient waste places, with those who go down yeah. to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited but I shall set glory in the land of the living so there's a lot there but it's all about there being these particular ones who have sinned are being put into a pit this is a pit <clears throat> Tartarus We're gonna, I, I'll show you a map in a little bit where it's at and, and how it works with the rest of hell hell has compartments is but, but they, it's better instead of me saying hell let me change that word the underworld has compartments all right? Okay. Because hell is a particular part of it. Paradise was there also. You guys know that, right? Yeah. Paradise. <laughs> Sheol means the grave, the part above all of it. But anyways, we'll get into it when I show you a picture. If we got, yeah, I think we'll have time. So, but let me, let me show you what Jude has to say about all this. Okay, by the way, so Peter is getting it from Ezekiel, but he's quoting directly from a book called Enoch. The book of Enoch. Okay? The book of Enoch, first Enoch, if you're going to be technical, is a book that was written in between Malachi and the time of Jesus. We call that the intertestimonial period, also known as the period of the second temple to Jewish people. During that period of time, they had these books that were written and they used people's names from the Bible, but they weren't written by those people in the Bible. So Enoch was not written by Enoch. Okay, it's a story about Enoch, but 
in some parts of Christianity, Enoch is in their Bible. It's canonized. But for most of us, it's not in our Bible. It's not in the Catholic Bible, and it's not in Protestant Bibles, but it is in the Bible of the Church of Ethiopia. Okay? I have one of my students, she's from Ethiopia, and we were having a discussion about this. She opened up her Bible. It had a book of, of Enoch in there. Oh, my goodness. All right? To them, is Holy Scripture. What was interesting is this is word for word right from the book of Enoch. Peter knew Enoch. He knew the book. And Jude does too. We're going to go to Jude now. All right? Jude, 6 and 7. Wow. And the angels who did not stay with their position, their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. What I want you to see here is these angels did not stay in their position. They left it. And in verse 7, he's tying that story back to the Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? What do you think is, what, what's the connection between those two? Evidently it happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is known for their homosexuality. Right. Are we saying angels are homosexuals? Evidently. No, no. Nope. The analogy is close but flawed. Okay. It so pursued unnatural desires, which means that something that was not of God. Yes. So, so anything. Now, if you're some of the modern uh, progressive churches would say, yeah, it's all about the homosexual part. But let me show you something really interesting. Unnatural desire in the Greek. Um, well, let, let me see if my Bible here says it. Um, okay, yeah, verse 7. In my, in, I'm reading from the New American Standard now. It's a little bit different than ESV. New American Standard says, verse 7, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality, they went after strange flesh. So, do your Bibles have strange flesh there? Perversion. Yeah? Perverted? Okay, so this is what's happening. In Greek, there's two words that you should know. The word homo and hetero. Okay? We use them in sex. We say homosexual is sex between the two that are the same. Homo means the same. Heterosexual means sex between two that are not the same. So if you're a man and wife, you're heterosexual. If you are of the same sex, married, same sex, you're homosexual. Does that make sense so far, the word homo and hetero? So the word for, uh, oh, you don't see it on this one. But the word for uh, flesh says strange flesh. The word here for flesh is sarx, S-A-R-X. So we have to ask our question, is it homo sarx? Or heterosarchs. It's using heterosarchs. The angels went after a different type of flesh than what they had. Does that make sense? Okay. Heterosarchs. So what we see happening here is that they left their position of authority. They rebelled. They left their proper dwelling. And they had sex with creatures that were not the same as themselves. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of summarizing all that for you. Isn't this all bizarre? Okay. Really bizarre. Well, it's because they weren't the same as God. They were daughters of Eve. They were daughters of Eve. They were human flesh, and these <coughs> sons of God are not human. That's our point. They're not the human. They're not the, the lineage of Seth. Should we go a little bit further? I have a question, and yes. I'm afraid to ask it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put up the cone of silence around all of us so that she's safe. That's from Get Smart. I read that passage, but left their proper dwelling. I, my mind goes to 
the experiences in the New Testament where Jesus came upon people that were possessed by demons and he cast them out? Is that what that's talking about? Wow, this is a great question. <laughs> because we're about to get into that. <laughs> okay, then just we're we're, we're going to get into what are demons because uh -huh. they are not angels. Where did they come from? Okay. And why is it they want to possess people? <laughs> and remember when Jesus came across one of the demiacs? He said to the demiac, What's your name? Yes. Yeah. And they said, Legion, because there's many of us. And then they said, Do not put us back in prison. Don't put us there. Right. We don't want to go there. Right. And he says, Then go into the pigs. <coughs> And they, they went into the pigs, and the pigs killed themselves. Right. They jumped over the cliff and drowned themselves. So what's happening there? It's a continuation of what is this demonic spirit. And we're going to learn what they are, because that's a part of the unseen realm. Okay, yes. Can I ask a question that kind of like what she said, you're afraid almost to ask? Yes. <laughs> Jesus was part human. And what? Jesus was part human and the Son of God. He's fully man, not part. He's fully man and fully God. He's not part of each of them. He's fully both of them. Okay. All right, go ahead. But that, you know, I'm looking at, you know, was that something that God planned to be? God planned everything from before the foundation of the world, even before the fall of any of these angels or anything else. God has always known ahead of time what was going to happen, and he had a plan for all of it. That's what we're going to keep on seeing. As we go further and further into this, we're going to be more and more amazed with the plan that God has in dealing with all of this. Legion and his pals don't want to be a people because they're in prison? No, they want to be in people. Okay, the demons want to possess a body. <coughs> but they're not the ones that are in prison. The fallen ones that are in prison are fallen sons of God. Demons are not sons of God. Well, we won't answer that question today, but we'll get oh. but we'll get closer. We'll get closer. So we got to go through the thir first. We got to go through the three rebellions. We're only in rebellion number two. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's a picture of what the underworld looks like. This is written. This is drawn by a pastor by the name of Larkins, who was a a um, he was a uh, a drawer of buildings. What do they call that? An architect? architect. He's an architect. He's a pastor who's an architect. All right. So, what happens here? Is I'll, I'll talk you through it. The top, the top part says the word grave. That's the Hebrew word geber, and it's the Greek word uh, nimian. And the grave is the first level of the underworld. Okay? Then, remember when the thief on the cross, Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paradise is under the underworld. It's one of the chambers. And today it's empty. But at that time, it was full of Old Testament saints. Where did they go when they died? They did not go to heaven. I'll give you Bible verses. Paradise. I'm going to give you a lot of Bible verses for all this later. But today you're just getting a summary. So they did not, when a saint of the old, Abraham, did not go to heaven. He went to paradise. And between paradise and hell, Hades, there's a great gulf. And remember Abraham... Um, in that story, it says that there was a man who died, Lazarus died, and the rich man says, he, rich man over here in hell sees Lazarus in paradise across that gulf and says, go back and tell my family this is a horrible place. And um, he says, no, sorry, can't do that. There's a, once you're in here, you don't go anywhere else. But God made the exception, by the way. His exception was... Remember the story of Saul and the witch of Endor? Yeah. And how, you know, Samuel. Uh, Samuel was able to show up. So God does make exceptions, but normally doesn't. 
So now we have these two group here, and then we have a bottomless pit that the Bible tells us. Out of the <coughs> bottomless pit, which is under the Euphrates River, he will bring up in the days of, Re of Revelation, you know, during the, the last tribulation, out of that bottomless pit will be these creatures that come up that will swarm and sting people. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys know that part of the story? Yes. Yeah, Revelation? They come up out of the bottomless pit. So there's something else down in there that's being held for judgment also. Then we have the Tartarus from 2 Peter and Jude. It's under the underworld also, but it's not the same as hell. That's why that translation for hell, I said, no, you should just use the word Tartarus. Let us learn the Bible words. Yes. Don't use the word hell if it's not hell. Use yeah. Tartarus, all right? So we see that that's a different chamber. And then in the future, at the last time, there will come a day where all these creatures are in the judgment, and after judgment, they get tossed into the lake of fire. It's not under the, it's not under the earth. But this is a drawing to make it easier to know that the lake of fire is separate from hell, from paradise, or from Tartarus, or from the bottomless pit. It's just a concept to help you know that there's a difference. Okay, so knowing that, when Jesus went into, when Jesus died, three days and three nights, mm -hmm. says that he went into hell. A preach. Do you guys know what he preached? Well, he's preaching to those who can't actually get saved. Right. Oh. All right, so there's something to think about. What did he preach? He's there for three days and three nights. And then it says, <coughs> when he ascended out of hell, he took with him those that were captive. And today they're with him in heaven. We're going to learn more about that next week. But he took those saints that were in paradise with him when he ascended. That's my alarm. So I'm supposed to stop talking. Want me to finish? All right. So notice something here. This is really interesting. The fallen angels were cast down into Tartarus. Those in paradise were resurrected. They were. They were. Their bodies weren't resurrected, but they were. They were taken with Jesus up to heaven. There's coming a day when the full resurrection happens for all all the saints. When they all get their bodies. All right. And then notice over here, uh, the fallen angels and those who are in hell will all be taken to the judgment seat. There's a judgment coming. This is like a jail holding them, waiting for the court. And when they go to court, when they're found guilty, then they go to prison. The lake of fire would be the equivalent of the prison. That's a lifetime sentence. So we'll see what that means later. We're still, we're, we're going to go into all of this over time. This is where we're headed. When we say unseen realm, this is a part of it. But I thought this, this passage did a good job of summarizing it, making it easier for us to see the yeah. concepts. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's like that for reals. This is, this is not a, like a map. This is just the ideas so we know that they're all separate, but yet they're all related to each other. Yeah. Any questions on that? Yes? Well, I just haven't... Something I just need to say. <laughs> the bottomless pit. When you say it's bottomless, that means it goes on forever, right? I mean, so does it just keep filling up with people? I mean, you know, well, there's only certain things in the bottomless pit, and there's no humans there. Okay. We're going to learn a little bit more about that later. What is in each of these compartments, and how they relate back to demons? <laughs> okay. How they relate back to the Nephilims? Where are the Nephilims? What happened to the Nephilims? And anyways, I just wanted to give you a precursor to where we're headed, knowing that, yeah, we're not going to shy away from talking about these things. Cool. Even if we don't know anything about them, we're going to figure it out. We're going to keep on studying the scriptures. All right, let me close this in prayer. Father, I pray that you're glorified in all things that we do and that this will be a study that is accurate, that we would continue to study to show ourselves approved and able to accurately handle your word. I pray, Lord, that if things on this were not accurate, it will continue to be revealed as we study it. For our job is to learn your truth, 
not to make our own up. I would pray, God, that you be glorified and that your son would be lifted up on high because without Jesus Christ, all of this goes straight to the lake of fire. And it's only through the salvation obtained through Jesus that we can even look forward to a hope of one day being with you. I would pray that your spirit would guide us this week and remind us of these truths. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.